Makes you think you're in the hills of Tennessee just watching nature go by. Yes, I love that kind of music. Anyway, welcome everybody. I'm back again. I know. It seems like it was just yesterday to me. But anyway, today I have a bunch of topics that I had in mind for last week. Except Mike decided to stay with us most of the uh, live stream. Which was about two and a half hours for him. And uh, I found that to be uh, very grateful in my part because, you know, my voice kind of goes after a while. So, so far we got uh, 16 people logged on and one, two, three, four, five folks jumping into the chat. We have Harold Goldberg always. We all know what he has. Happy Hanukkah to everybody. And again, happy Thanksgiving to those who celebrate it. Last week, we went over to my surrogate granddaughter's uh, house. They have a farm here in Maryland. And I'm not really her blood grandfather, but she calls me grandpa. So that's nice. Always nice to have a extra granddaughter, even though she's not blood related. We had a great time. Great meal. Did not eat too much. I promise you guys. And I got to meet some folks that I have never met before. Had a wonderful time chatting with them. Jerry Lonko is here, Silkirk, Manitoba, Canada. Again, you can read what he has. <laughs> Rick Johnson says, Yeehaw, opening music. Yes, I got a bunch of that. And that's going to be uh, used in the next few live streams as well. I found a really nice uh, composer who does uh, audio, free audio for YouTube videos. Realize that you really cannot use copyrighted material, even though you might go ahead and give them credit. They will get the monetization for that video, and we cannot afford to do that. So I always use free, non-copyrighted music that is available through the uh, music library here or audio library on YouTube. Miss Wendy is here from Belgium, Pro 1000, of course. Welcome back. Jeff Thompson from South Louisiana. Rudy is here from L.A., and uh, he's the creator of all of these products that we have here available here. Uh, I've been using them as well. He's a master 3D printer, something I would like to learn someday. Henry Stoffel. Met for mass, and again, PA hundred Q image seems to be the pretty pretty much the same um, routine. PA hundreds, Pro one thousands, Pro one hundreds, and a lot of people are using uh, Precision Colors inks. Emmanuel from Normandy in France is here. He's got a brand new Canon Pro three hundred ink owl inks, and hopefully everything is fine with your inks over there. Um, it's one of the few companies that will ship overseas that's always nice to have available if you don't live here in this um, part of the world Visi today from canada pro 100 it's got rick johnson cartridges q image pcse very good by the way last friday and i think throughout the weekend they're still having the 
so-called Black Friday sale for Q Image. If you're sitting on the fence about getting it, get it now because you will get the double discount if you use my link. I know that um, Andrew posted the affiliate link, my link for Q Image One, which covers everything really you need for printing, whether you are on a Mac platform or a Windows computer, you will be able to do everything you need to do to print. And really, I use QImage mostly 90% for my printing jobs, regardless of where I edit my images. And simply put, it's because of the output quality that you get on your prints. And Dirk is here from Bruges in Belgium. Pro of uh, 29, 2100 on Incao links. Great. And uh, how are you working that out? How how are you using third-party inks on your 2100? Please share that with us. Are you refilling an original cartridge? Are you disabling ink monitoring? Are you using, um, probably over there, there are available refillable cartridges with um, special uh, single-use chips or whatever. Uh, please share with us what you are doing and how you're making this work for you, especially with ink owl inks. Speaking about inks and products, let's let's discuss a little bit because I had a conversation with Mike after the live stream. And keep in mind, is a two-person business, him and his wife. And his wife does a lot of menial stuff for him. And she's running out of energy. She's really getting a little bit um, not disappointed with the business but just tired and so i have a fear that not too long into the future he might decide to close his business i don't know yet but that's what i that's what i'm smelling in our conversation and it, it comes it, it just basically comes from just getting burnt out and it's not like a real company with a staff of people, a shipping department like Ink Owl has, like Cone Color has, like, you know, many, many other companies have. Keep in mind that these inks are available from probably one or two labs in this country. There is no difference between that brand, that brand, and that brand, unless they specifically say, that they have, let's say, their inks made for them by a custom lab. Supposedly, that's what Cone Color does. They have a lab that makes inks only for them. Now, Precision Colors gets their inks from a U.S.-based lab, but he's able to get them tweaked to his preference or his, I guess, formulations. Now, that same lab will make inks for Ink Owl, Ink Republic, and I don't know how many other U.S.-based um, companies there are, but keep in mind that also the fact that he and I are becoming bombarded, and I mean bombarded, by how do I do this? How do I do that? How do I, you know, that's what my channel is for, but that's not what he is here for. His products are proven. If you cannot make them work, that means you did not do your basic research prior to buying them. His products are not that unique that require like specific instructions on how to use. The same thing with refillable cartridges. Let me see if I have some here. So something like this, the same factory makes them for everyone who sells these. These are t 159s and that's for the R2000 back there. They're identical, okay? So it's not like Ink Owl's version of those cartridges requires specific instructions or Cone Color version of those cartridges requires specific instruction or PC. No. So my point is that we, myself, what more... I am here for that, okay? But companies like Ink Owl and Precision Colors and others are not here to teach you how to use these products. These are basically generic products. I spent 
almost two and a half years just researching and looking. I was I got into this at the very beginning of inkjet printing for photography. No one knew how to do any of this. Even the companies that produce products, they were just kind of guessing as to how to proceed with this new technology, how to create a continuous tone image made from little ink dots. Unheard of, unheard of back then. Yes, we had half-tone printing at very low resolutions, like newspaper was 85 per inch, okay, 85 dots per inch. You could see those dots, definitely. Magazines use four colors. They use about 133, 166 dots per inch, and each of the so-called yellow, cyan, magenta, and black layers were angled differently to kind of blend the dots so that it would look more continuous tone. But all you needed was a low power magnifying glass to look and see that indeed they were made out of dots. So now they use the same exact technology. They're still producing dotty looking images on magazines. Well, inkjet printer proceeded to increase and increase and increase the so-called printing resolution. And cameras were terrible back then too. So, you know, be aware of that. So finally, we got to where we are today. But like I said, it took me two and a half years to get there, okay, before I kind of grasped the idea. A lot of people want to get into this, and they buy a printer that possibly is above their skill level. And I don't mean that as an insult, because I went through the same thing. I was way under the required skill level to perform this process and get you know, reasonably good results at the end of the day. So buy the PC inks, but please learn how to print elsewhere. It's not his job or Ink Owl's job or, you know, Cone Color's job to teach you how to print, to teach you how to, you know, um, let me see if I got another one here, how to refill a cartridge. Okay, that's my job. That's what I that's what I'm here for. I am not here to say uh, review printers. I am not here to review products. That's that's been covered by other people. They get products sent to them for review. I get occasional products sent to me. But remember, we are sort of tied to third party printing. Although I, I use OEM inks, but I'm refilling with those. So I'm still kind of in the third-party realm of things. So, yes, I will teach you the process of printing. What you were required to know 10 years ago is the same thing you're required to know today. It's just that printers are newer. They have more inks, more channels, different uh, print heads. But again... Basically, the bottom line is the same process, the same process. So please learn how to do that rather than calling these companies and asking them these mundane questions about printing. You should have learned how to drive before you bought your car. And you better learn how to drive before you get your license, obviously, as well. So the same thing, you know, goes with printing. Um don't waste these companies' times, and I, I've been guilty of that, because their job is to provide us with good products. And maybe in the background, they are doing research and development for these products as printers evolve to super superior quality outputs. They have to evolve with their third-party products so that they can at least you know, come close to the quality a new printer is capable of producing. So again, they're not there to teach you how to print. They're not there to teach you how to solve a clog. <laughs> That's because you didn't print enough. That's really the simple answer to that. Uh, it could be also air. That means you did not refill or prime your cartridge properly. Again, you should have learned to do that before you got into this game. And I don't mean to be nasty, but I get so many questions there. It's like, I, I go like, oh gosh, why why are you even asking that? 
you should have learned to drive before you got behind the wheel, you see, because then you're going to have an accident. You're going to have an accident or a problem with your printer because you did not learn the basics and you went ahead and spent $1,500 on a, on a fancy printer and you have no clue what you're doing. That happens every single day. Every single day I get these questions. And that's why I get tired and I don't want to even come down here and make a video. And I had a list of subjects to cover. I made one the other day and I'm going to touch on that tonight a little bit more. And, you know, that was the question that I also get is why certain colors just simply don't reproduce on paper the way I see them on my monitor. Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it, that is a misconception that we have, that we think that printer with just six colors or even four or eight or nine or 12 can produce over 16 and a half million shades of color. Are you kidding me? It, it, it just can't. It, it cannot. It can give you a pleasant um, depiction of what you see on your monitor. As long as it's not yellowish, magenta-ish, cyan, bluish, brownish, whatever, as long as it's neutral and you got a relatively you know, wide uh, tonal range, okay, high dynamic range, let's just say, that's as good as it's going to get, folks. It's not going to match the ability of a display, especially LED or LCD display, which can show you these neon-looking colors. You cannot produce neon-looking colors with ink. You cannot especially pigment inks. So enough of that. Please please tone down the number of emails and calls you make to Precision Colors because it's going to get to the point where that's going to put him over the edge and he may consider retiring pretty soon. Okay. I don't want to put I don't want to put that out as a fact, but gosh, he he tells me he's so tired about about this business. And I I have to sympathize. Because I'm also tired about this. This was supposed to be for fun and a hobby. And now it's a job for me. I cannot do anything, you know, plan a vacation or something like that. Because I got to make sure that I maintain my upload rate, which I have really dropped. Okay. Lately, especially after my hijacking, um, you know, I have to maintain that to keep the channel alive. Because if I let it go, it's slowly going to be ignored by the suggestion algorithm that YouTube uses. So that's it about that subject. Again, people, just come to my live stream. I will show you how to do things. I will demonstrate different processes. But I am not here to tell you how to, you know, print with ink owl inks or PC inks. I'll show you how to print with any inks, with any cartridges. Learning how to use inks and cartridges, that's that's a different realm. That's not what I am here or what anyone out there is, you know, that sells these products is here for. Um, they give you instructions. Basically, it's very simple. You just add ink and you prime. As long as you have primed the cartridge, it will perform. It will provide ink flow to you, to your printer. Okay, after that, the process of printing requires a color managed workflow. That's not their job to, to, to teach you. The car company is not their job to teach you how to drive. You see what I mean? Okay. The, the person who sells, the company that sells you your cooktop or your stove, that's not their job to teach you how to cook or to bake. It's their job to sell you that product, and you are on your own. So, again, I don't want to let you guys be on your own. My job for this channel has become teaching you how to properly print so that you get a reasonable, reasonable match of what you see on your screen. Okay? Simple as that. All right. Enough of that. I hope I didn't scare everybody. We got 35 people here. I don't know how many we had earlier. But that's that's really you know not much to ask. I mean, that's that's the way I, I think um, it should be. 
Let me see. George is here from Cyprus, Pro 10, Pro 1000. Somebody uh, put out a rumor about a replacement for the Pro 1000, but they really didn't go into much detail. They quoted some Canon rumor um, website that really wasn't too um, informative when I looked at it. Dirk says, I am refilling via transparent uh, 750 ml cartridges and disabling ink monitoring. Okay. I weigh my cartridges every month. Awesome. So, you know, you could refill your um, originals. Hang on. My room is such a mess right now. Here we go. So, I was using original inks. These are, these are genuine Canon cartridges. Where's the, uh, yeah, right there, Canon. And what I did was rather than continuously insert two needles into this dual port system that these, after the Pro 1000, this is the kind of system that you will be um, using. You see that right here as well on the smaller cartridge. And I decided to forget about it. I'm just going to drill two 530 seconds holes, get them nice and clean, put two plugs in it afterwards. So I poured out this ink into a 750 ml bottle and now i have ink ready to be aspirated as i need it and now these cartridges are now refillable okay and they have an unused chip on them right there because this has never been installed in a printer and uh, i need to contact pc and have the have him send me a huge crate of these cartridges. I will make those available to you guys as long as you can come through and do that for me. Because I will go ahead and prep them for refilling. Now you could actually put a larger uh, fill hole. Let me see what I got here. Because. I have a plug here that I want to show you guys. Cis units have a larger diameter, big rubber plug, such as this. So what you would do is basically leave this be, cut it right there, measure the diameter. Look at the way it bulges out a little bit. It actually bulges out a little bit at the end. This is this part is to pull it off. This part is to enter the cis unit tank. And it has a little bulge at the end. That means once it compresses through and it re-expands, it creates a very good seal. So a larger hole in one of these plugs. A small hole for venting. You just basically put a little funnel here and fill your cartridge. Put about 700 ml rather than 750 and then just weigh them then you know every month or so as, as you use them and then these will come with a unused chip because all we're doing with these cartridges is extracting the inks we're not really using them in fact all of the big epson cartridges that i've had the same condition cartridge has never been used i just extracted the ink out of it which makes it then a reusable cartridge, at least for one use. So that's 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 a neat uh, way to do it. Um, again, um, if you have transparent cartridges, I wouldn't bother with weighing. You can just open the um, the lid, remove the cartridge, look at it, and see how much ink is them is in them. You don't have to uh, weigh them. Now, those are opaque, so yeah, I would have to weigh them or shake them. You know, give it a shake. You you know you have ink inside them. You know, you will know. M Me-ish. Me. Why can't I buy the powder ink and mix it myself? You mean pigment. Actually, yes, you can. It's a big, messy process, and I know nothing about it. But that's a new world. That's a different world. Of, of repacking uh, 
like laser printer pigment cartridges. Okay. I think, but, oh, wait, wait. Are you saying powder ink? No, 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 my dear. The ink formulations are extremely complicated. There is no such thing as mixing it in water. Just a clear fluid onto which they add the the pigments or the dyes or the um, biocides that they used to, you know, to prevent any biological contamination of the inks is very complicated. There, it's not a thing as you know, just dissolving a, a powder in water, for instance. No, I wish it was that simple. But welcome, nice to have you here. Charles Verbruggen, Antwerp, Belgium. 9500 Mark II and a Pro 1000. Awesome, awesome. Art is here, West Tennessee. Did you like my music, Art? At the beginning, you probably didn't hear it if you were not here early. El Capitan, that's a Mac OS. CS4 PC and Pigment Refill Inks. From whom? Whose inks are you using? Michael Sanchez, does Precision Color sell ink for the Epson TE8550? Yes, they sell pigment ink for that printer. Now, if you want dye ink, you may have to go elsewhere. I don't think he's going to um, get into that side of things. Uh, he prefers pigment because the ink set that he's using is proven. It um, will require profiling, as all third-party inks tend to do. Um, the inks that come with the 8550 also kind of require profiling if you want to get into some slightly higher level photographic printing. That's something that I have in the books to possibly buy the upcoming year, depending on availability here. They were available at our micro center and they just evaporated within a few days. Ah, okay. So you're using PC. All right. So far, let's see, 37 folks. It's Thanksgiving weekend. People have better things to do than to come here and listen to me yap. So PA-100, Pro-3800, Pro-3880, maintenance card resetting. I had a problem with my Pro 1000 a few weeks ago. The matte black channel wasn't printing. So while I was dealing with that for a couple of days, I decided to go ahead and uh, print a panoramic image that I prepared for a miniature project that my wife and I were working on. Basically, it's just a diorama. And I, I, I wanted a panorama of uh, Nathan's Woods. So I did a three image stitch and went ahead and printed it on the uh, 3800. But I needed to do a cleaning cycle because I had not used it for a while. See what I mean? Okay. So I pulled back my roll of uh, luster paper that I had loaded on it, put some regular letter size paper, and did my nozzle check. It needed a couple of uh, uh, cleaning cycles to get it nice and clean. Perfect nozzle check. Then I thought, wait a second. The reason that my Pro 1000's matte black channel wasn't even showing up on a, on a nozzle check, it was either because I had a massive air bubble, and how do I know how that got there, or because I hadn't used my matte black for ages, right? So I decided I better do an ink switch, a black ink switch on my P800, which I performed. I ran a nozzle check after performing the black ink switch, meaning I went from photo black to matte black. For instance, if I had been printing on glossy paper, I would have been on photo black, and now I want to print on matte paper. So I did the switch, nozzle check. And yeah, my matte black wasn't complete. So I did, a nozzle, I did a cleaning cycle, another nozzle check, good to go. I loaded up about five sheets of matte paper, and I proceeded to do a, a run of like five images and Everything was fine, printed beautifully. <laughs> so <laughs> what happens? Like things couldn't just continue going well, right? I said, okay, now I can go back to my 
photo black, reload my paper, which I had to clean, I had to cut, trim a, a nice square front edge again so that it would accept it as I'm loading it. And my maintenance card warning goes off. It did that on my Pro 1000 as well, by the way. I go, oh gosh, okay. Do I have an M a brand new P800 maintenance cartridge? Of course not. I did not. So I decided to use one of my repacked and reset cartridges. That was fun. There is a process to that. Let me show you. So after searching high and low, I finally found a brand new one. Comes with a little bag for you to dispose of the cartridge with. Remember, these are for those three printer models I just mentioned. P800, 3880, and 3800. So this is what the cartridge looks like, brand new. You can see that the layers of packing material is standing on end so that liquid can penetrate readily, okay, on the edges of each one of these layers. Over here, we have a chip. And the top is removable. There's a dual type tab system. You can see it right there. It's tricky, but you can remove this top, rip out the insides, rinse the whole tray out, and then pack it with whatever will accept water. I found this material online. It is used to line, say, you know, the floor of a garage or working on a car. But it's not only water um, accept accepts water it accepts oil as well so it's both hydrophilic as well as you know accepting oil so what do i do fold it like that and i put it inside the cartridge as you can see right here and i pop the lid back on it i've been doing this for several years at least okay and they work now Here's the trick. You need a chip resetter for the 3800, 3880, okay? There isn't one for the P800 officially. So you use one of these resetters here. And it's very tricky because it's a manual lining up of the pins The little pins right here against the chips contacts. It's a touch and go system. And sometimes I gotta take my glasses off to be able to see what I'm doing. And it's dark in here, so it's very difficult. Let me get this lined up. So we got a red light. We still got a red light, so that's that's a bad contact. I wish they had a system that lines it up for you, but it, they don't. They do not. Red and red. So we're getting bad contacts here. So you see, it's not as easy. So what would you rather do? Spend, I think it was $38 for this cartridge. Green. Okay, and then it goes out. So now this is this is reset. But here's the catch. If that was the one that lived inside the printer, the one that got declared as full, you reset it and you think you're gonna put it back in your printer and it's going to be accepted. No, it's not going to be accepted. Even the Pro 3800, 3880, which accepts a cartridge that I reset that way, a regular ink cartridge, as long as it's you know done properly, 
it will not accept that same cartridge, this one, because it remembers that chip. The chip has an ID code. It's got a face. It's got an ID. It recognizes that chip. And it says, no, 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 no. That's the same chip you put before. And I told you it was full. And now you're trying to fool me. Yeah. So you have to fool it. The ink chip memory is humongous. It can remember probably thousands of ID codes. But the memory for these is only one code deep. So what you do is you buy one of these and just use it as a dummy. Insert it. It gets accepted, of course. You close the little lid. You wait a few seconds. You see it displayed on your LCD screen, LED screen. Open the lid back up, remove it, and now you can put this one in. Because it accepted the other one that I had never seen before, it recorded that code and deleted the previous one. Which one? Where are you at? Right here. It deleted this one and recorded that one. Now I remove that one and I put this one back in. It doesn't know that this was once in there because it deleted its existence, its previous existence. And now it will delete that one. You see what I mean? So you have to have a dual set of these cartridges to be able to do that on the PA-100, for instance, as well as the other printers. Now, finally, I was able to find some of these. And again, they're easy to refill by easy i mean you know it's possible it's not an impossible um, process and will allow you to continue printing if all of a sudden boom you're 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 surprised by a full maintenance cartridge warning remember what i was doing was just having fun I was, I was, you know, doing stuff that I should have been doing all along, like changing, switching my black inks. You have to do that. Do not think you're going to get away of not wasting a little bit of black ink during that switch by simply never doing it. Oh, I'm never going to print on matte media anyway. Oh, I'm never going to print on glossy media anyway. Yeah, eventually that valve goes bad. Now, the new printers, the 900 and the 700, do no longer have a black ink switch. Earlier Epson printers at 2200, 2100, um, 2400, 2880, they had separate, they had cartridges, but only one channel because they all had eight channel printheads and they use one ink too many. So you basically simply remove the photo black cartridge and put the matte black cartridge in place. Runs a purge cycle, again, what it would normally do during a black ink switch anyway. And you can then go ahead and continue printing. I prefer the manual switch rather than the automatic, oh, we're doing you a favor now. We're gonna give you an automatic black ink switch valve. Oh, wonderful. No, it was another mechanical thing that, that could break down. Why? Because we just won't use it enough. And that was a big problem there. So anyway, yes, you can repack those, those, those cartridges. And just for your information, P100 owners, again, I found one. It was 38 bucks. They normally used to sell for, I think it was $22, okay? So they've gone up in price. They're not re readily available everywhere like they used to be. So be aware of that and, and make sure that you always have some of those available for you, you know, sitting, waiting to be used because you never know when you're going to get that warning.
Let's see. Do, 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 do. So Nikos is here from Greece. TM200 G540 from Canon, I believe. Yes, both of them are Canon. Michael McLean, hello from Fairbanks, Alaska. Fairbanks, Alaska. Happy holidays, Pro 100 QMH and the Mac. All right, so that's QMH one you're using. Awesome. Again, remember, folks, get it with my whether you buy it a black market or not. Black market, Black Friday deals or not, or maybe Cyber Monday, who knows, or not. Make sure you use my link. Use my link. It's on all my video descriptions. Use my link. You get 10% off. Why do you want to pay full price? All right. 10% off. You help the channel. You help the channel so I can continue doing this for you all and save you some money. Why not? And if you can do it this week, you'll double savings. You cannot beat that. Jeff Thompson says to Michael Cavaliere, the Epson 8550 printer is an eco tank printer and the ink is already a fraction of the cost. Yes, as far as third party, don't even bother. Just use Epson inks. $18, $1,800 pennies. $1,800 pennies for, a, for 70 ml of ink. Come on. You know, you cannot beat that. You cannot beat that. So just stick with OEM inks. And if you want to go pigment like, like PC did, then, yeah, he's got the inks. He developed the inks for the 8550. And he's going to be providing you with uh, custom-made profiles for a variety of papers if you choose to go that route. Once you go that route, you cannot be switching back to some other ink. Okay, keep that in mind. Remember, you have ink lines that were full of air. You flush those with either OEM inks, dye, and a matte and a pigment black, I believe. I think it's five dye colors, and then a including a photo black and also a pigment black, which I believe is triggered for matte use as well as um, for your plain paper printing. Plus, it has a scanner. A, I think it's a um, eleven by something scanner. It's quite quite large, larger than the normal, larger than the one I have. So yeah, it's not really a, a, a good thing. It's not really a good thing to be, um, you know, considering a third party dye ink source for the eighty five fifty, when you can already fill it so cheaply to begin with. And get the best quality that they can provide you. Okay. Bob Powell says, hello, Jose. Sorry for about the hack. Yeah, I know. Uh, I wasn't the only one, by the way. For the Pro 100 PC inks, what's the minimum amount of printing needed to keep it exercised? Huh, I would tell you every day. Any ink. It doesn't matter. PC or non-PC. Uh, but no, nah, you know, every, every few days. You know, every few days run an also check. An also check will exercise all specifically all the channels. Okay. It's not going to composite anything. It's going to specifically draw ink from channel yellow, magenta, cyan, black, and so forth. A purge print, for instance, in other words, like if you make a set of uh, bands of different colors, it's not going to exercise just magenta. Magenta is not magenta when it comes to magenta on a print. The color magenta is actually created by compositing magenta and possibly a little bit of cyan because that magenta ink is probably a little bit too reddish to begin with. That's the way it is, and that's part of the print engine. That's the way the print engine works. So in order to really, truly exercise the printer and nozzle check, okay? And nozzle check can be done every day, every day. Or every other day, if you don't want to go that, you know, that often, but not every month. Okay, just just make sure that you do it often enough. If you knew what has to happen in order to print, you would realize, oh yeah, now I get it. Now I know why it's it's really imperative that I run nozzle checks or print something at least daily. I will. 
I will. Thank you. Carlos Brisemo, Briseno. I use the Pro 100, Pro 200 from Hawthorne, California. All right. I lived in Southern Cal as a kid. Ronald Basket says, uh, thank you all for your years of information. It has made my printing enjoyable. Well, thank you. It's been a lot of fun. I just don't want it to become a career job. This has got to it's got to stay on, on the fun level for me. And that's what I've been telling PC. I kind of I kind of suggested to him, and I gotta call him. Maybe I'll call him back after this, see if he answers. Um that he should consider, and by the way, he has oh, porque está porque es tan difícil conseguir repuesto para la repuestos para la Epson. Okay, why is it so difficult to get refillable for the Epson uh, 15,000? Because it's they suck, okay, uh, and they don't have chips. No tienen chips. Los cartuchos no tienen chips. Y la única forma es que usar una firmware chipless. The only way is to use firmware, uh, chipless firmware on that printer. You can refill the originals. Puedes rellenar los, los cartuchos originales con tinta, especially from precision colors. That's what I am using. I'm going to show you. I've shown you this before. I'll show it again. This is a, a, a cartoon. Beautiful. This used to be a poster. I got the image from the uh, actual provider. And I printed that on the XP 15,000. And I'm going to be doing a demo on Photoshop showing you how to soft proof, how to, how to tell when a color that you see on your screen is just not going to print the way you see it. So don't freak out, okay? It's, it's a normal thing, okay? It cannot do it, absolutely cannot do it. Pedro Juan Rosado, soy puertorriqueño ra radicado in Cleveland. Okay, so he's a Puerto Rican who lives in Cleveland, Ohio. And he says, thank you for your uh, advice and tutorials. All right. Now, finally, and I was freaking out completely, MC20s. What is an MC20? It's a maintenance cart cartridge for the Pro 1000. They seem to have disappeared from production. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why they were not available. Something about, you know, the uh, maybe the chips were not available for them. Maybe some component. It's always something small that prevents the whole process, final production of a, of a product to uh, be finished and be available, be made available to buyers like us. So... I've been looking and looking and looking, and people who did have them wanted up to $90 for a cartridge. Not when it sells for $14.95, folks, retail. I'm not going to pay that kind of money. So before I was able to find some, bingo, right there. One. I got another one someplace. So I got two here. Two and three. So I got five cartridges. That's going to last me quite a while. But, you know, that's not going to prevent me from continuing printing and doing what I do with the Pro 1000, testing all of these different systems. I could not print anymore. I didn't have a maintenance cartridge. <laughs> I was stuck. So what I did to get me out of this conundrum before I was able to get those. And by the way, the big box on the bottom came from uh, Adorama in New York. Okay. I had had an order for them for about two months. And finally, they became available and they sent me a notice and I received it uh, like last week. So I'm, I'm all set right now. Assuming nothing happens to my Pro 1000. I just did an also check prior to the show going live, and everything is perfect. So that's good. Anyway, what to do? Oh, man. So here's what I did. Ugh. 
here's the heavy cartridge it is full you can see how dirty the intake intake port is and these breather it's almost getting a little bit stained there which is you know it's not supposed to happen so apparently these cartridges they will saturate themselves in this manner because i i completely tore one apart it's not that easy to 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 open up by the way this is a single welded construction process it's not something i i believe that 2100 2000 2100 and higher you can actually unscrew the lids apart and and repack it and there's a resetter available for them but not this one this one i would have to literally cut off so how to do that couldn't really find a way to do that cleanly so i tried just shaving the top off just this upper layer no there's a grid of little walls right here okay and each little space is packed with a single sheet of absorbent material a different density than the bottom one and i could not pull this off it's really super tough extremely tough stuff i used a big pair of you know vice grips and i literally broke the cartridge trying to remove the pads because i did not want to take the whole top off this is in the way this is in the way you cannot do that so what precision colors did he cut it with a hacksaw here just at this seam point and then across like that there's also another breather right there and another one right here you cannot remove the packing material on this side you can't so what to do it's going to be very difficult very if not impossible to really properly make this a repackable cartridge just like the epsons oh that's so much so much simpler this is extremely difficult i got a whole machine shop okay i could make working steam engines working miniature gasoline engines i used to do that machine them from raw metal and they actually work okay i have made miniature boilers that actually provide pressure for my little steam engines to run yeah that was my hobby back then okay so what to do when i tore that apart the bottom layer was pretty black okay pretty saturated the upper layer however was just a little bit gray so that tells me that there's enough room now Another thing that I would like to do to this is if I had a special tip, where is my syringe? Right here. If I had a special large diameter tip that I could insert here and just, I could weigh this right now. I know it weighs a certain amount, 400 and something grams. And I could inject water until I began to see maybe beginning to flood or stain this area here then I could determine how much more liquid can enter before it starts to overflow, literally internally, through this vent. So that's the problem. This tip will not work. So I have to find a tip that will allow me to sort of do a measurement of how much liquid can actually enter. Because when each one of these is declared full, they weigh vastly different weights. There's no rhyme or reason to this. There's really no, like, really precise accuracy where it knows how much volume of wasting can be pumped in here. If it did that, then you would get a reasonably close final weight. But no, they are all over, all over the place, okay? So it's very difficult. So what I have, I have two. I threw away the other two and I destroyed the third one. So I'm going to go ahead and weigh the ones that I have now that are declared, you know, full. I cannot reuse them. And then do that experiment. If I can find a chip, I mean, a, a tip, I got to talk to PC about that and reach a max volume of liquid inside this. And that will be basically by this layer here becoming wet. Remember, there is, there is packing material up here, but this layer exists 
right on top of the bottom layer, which is the layer that receives the most ink, okay? The ink goes in through here, and it actually gets deposited on the lower layer. So if I can add, I don't know, another 150 ml of water, then I know that I have a little bit of wiggle room. So the next step would be to determine, as you put a new one in, watch that level we'll look at it on your computer is more accurate than the actual screen on your pro 1000 watch that level and when it reaches say quarter quarter or 25 percent from empty reset the chip i have this plugged into my usb port let me orient this correctly you have a little light right here I gotta do this so you can see what I'm doing. Insert it in place. Press, blink, 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 and green. And it does not go out. Let go. Remove that. This cartridge chip is now empty. Okay? It is now empty. Now, for this to work, you have to do this. So let's just begin. Begin my, my little trick. Okay. And all I'm going to get, and this is $90. All I'm going to get out of this is maybe 25% more life out of it. Okay. These, when you insert them in the cartridge, is because your printer told you, hey, my maintenance cartridge is full. Click here. There is a maintenance tab that tells you to exchange your maintenance cartridge. You cannot just open the back door and pull it out without going through the proper process of removal. So you got to go to main. Say you put it in because it told you to do that. Open up the back. You put the new one in. You closed it. It got recognized. And you're now printing. You print for a month or two. And you realize that you have reached 25%. Go to maintenance, go to re replace the maintenance cartridge, even though it's not full yet. You have to do that. You cannot just open the door and remove it. You have to tell the printer you want to remove it. Okay. Don't ask me why, but you have to do that. It's the same thing with the ink cartridges. You have to open the lid in order to remove it. When you have the, the ink level sensor system, the lid is open. So you have to fool it. You have that, that sensor, sensor blocker. You have to remove the blocker, and the printer thinks you just opened the lid. And now it allows you to properly remove that cartridge and replace it or refill it or whatever you want to do. Same thing with this. You have to tell the printer, I would like to remove my maintenance cartridge. Click, click. Go ahead, sir or ma'am. I open up the back door, remove it, reset it, pop it back in, close the door. It's going to be declared as empty even though it has 25% of its capacity. Again, remember the capacity is like this in it. You'll get a little bit more life out of it. Is it worth it? I don't know. Maybe after, you know, 10 different maintenance cartridges. I'm just telling you that it is possible, okay? I just wish there was a way to basically surgically cut this apart and repack the inside. I, I, I'm i going to try yet again and see how much of that internal packing I can remove. Okay. And uh, maybe I have to do both sides. Maybe I'll have to do both sides. And once you do that, then see, I don't want to mess with this breather here. I don't know how critical that is. Ah, uh, anyway. The problem is these used to go for $14.50. They are still, when they are available, say for, from um, Adorama, that's what it cost me, $14.50 for three of them. So go to these companies, put the order in. You will not be charged until they are available for shipping. So make sure you always have some of these. Otherwise, you will have to do what I've been doing lately just to get a little bit more life out of my cartridges 
It's it's crazy. All right, let's see what else we got here. Ed Z, and we're up to 45 folks from Kingston, Ontario, Canada, Pro 1000 user. Gregory, hello from Toronto, Ontario. You're right in uh, PC country. I don't mean politically correct either. I mean precision colors. Right there. He's right there by the uh, border, actually. George is here. MC20s are available in Europe. Maybe the shortest issue is in the U.S. Yeah, I believe so. I was told that they are also available in Australia. Maybe now I need to look at my Amazon page and see if they are there because I had them as one of my items on my affiliate page. Pedro Juan Rosado says, Jose, how can I contact you to explain an accident I have with my printer? I created the board of the ink cartridges burnt what i created that the board of the ink cartridges what do you mean the board i don't know what you mean explícame papito okay um i'll give you my email address i'll put it right here it's public for everyone to use no problem here we go it's at the bottom of the chat Feel free to contact me. Yeah, if you burn something out, if you burn anything electronic, that's it. Not much you can do. Okay, as a reference for my empty MC20 cartridge, empty was 275 and full was 523. Let's see what I got. Where's my where's one of my scales at? Let's see what these are weighing at. We'll compare notes. Let me put this away. So we zero this down. Open the uh, lid. Zero the weight. Sorry, but you cannot see what I'm doing, but I'll, I'll just give you the uh, number. You said it was 523. I got 488. You see? There is a discrepancy. 488. I got another one in the back. Let me get it. Four ninety two. So I seem to be pretty close with these two, but I have had one. I think the one that I tore apart the other day was over five hundred. So you see, you have uh, quite a difference in weight. So I don't know how you know what kind of calculations does the printer use for that. But, you know, they don't seem to be that, you know, super accurate. Frank Dorr from Manitoba, Canada. We seem to have a lot of people from Manitoba. Uh, Pro 100 o OEM inks and can Epson papers. All right. Oh, you're using Epson papers. How are they working out? Awesome. The Fantastic Clan. Did you print canvas on your 9500 on precision color inks? I did not. I did not. In fact, um, my 9500 did not last very long. I bought it used. And the um, I think maybe internally somewhere, maybe the power supply died. I still have the printed printhead right here. I took it out and used it as a prop to show people. But yeah, it, it is dead. And so no power. I mean, it just will not power up. So I still have it. I need to just chuck it in and be done with it. I did not print, print canvas. It, it should have been a pretty good canvas printer. 
wasn't the greatest for um, anything other than matte because of the gloss. It's just horrible. And especially third-party inks. You cannot just categorize PC. All third-party pigment inks for the 9500 simply were not glossy. Jerry says, uh, did you speak with Q Image yet about getting a Jose discount on upgrade? Yeah, I um, I did. And uh, I think they're going to work on it. I'm not, I cannot tell you for sure what their plan is. I thought he mentioned something last week when he was on. on no, two weeks ago when he was on here. All right. Protected, protectant sprays. Should I use them? I print with OEM ink. Um, yeah. Yeah, you should. It's always a good idea. Especially on some papers, very delicate surface papers. If you're printing on RC papers, really, it's not going to protect them that much. And I, I'm talking about protection against abrasion and not necessarily uh, ink fading. If you print with OEM, you're going to get years and years of long-lasting, non-fade results with your um, inks. I have something here that's got to be got from the probably before 9-11, okay? And uh, it still looks the same as the day it was printed. That was from a um, Epson 2000. I think it's Stylus Photo 2000 back then. And so maybe not. That's a that's a larger capacity. I don't know what printed that, but it was an Epson printer from, you know, early early part of the uh, 2000 uh year 2000, maybe 2001. And should I have sprayed it? Sure. It would protect it against, you know, getting scratched if I stack it on a bunch of other material you know slides here and there grit can get in and, and scratch it is it necessarily something that you need to do to prevent ink fade uh, yes no depends how picky you are now if you're using third-party inks then yes definitely definitely uh, are you printing on on a uh, resin coated paper with lots of uh, optical brightening agents they tend to cause a more rapid deterioration of the image when exposed to gases, like in our atmosphere, we have ozone. Ozone is an oxidant. Dye inks will oxidize and fade very quickly. So seal them. Seal them by spraying your prints with a sealant. Do I have any of those here available? No, I think I put them all back. But I have a bunch of them on my affiliate page as well. Hanamiel makes one. Uh, Moab makes one. Uh, that's a desert varnish. That's one of my favorites. Uh, I think that's probably those two are the ones that I would consider. I know that Breathing Color also makes uh, print protectant sprays and also varnishes for your canvas prints. Um, again, they just provide a seal against gas attacks. Basically, that's what really fades your prints. Not so much light, but gas. Okay, so keep that in mind. And you have to find one that will not cause a change in the look of the finished product. And you only know that when you use them. So, yeah, it, it's going to take some experimentation. Again, I've used about three of them. And the one that I love the most that causes the lowest amount of change of the look of the print is Desert Varnish from Moab. Moab. I do that specifically on certain papers as well. Let me come back with one print. So this is a, a depiction of a outdoor cafe 
on real watercolor paper. It's not for inkjet. It does not have a true black, okay? Because it just cannot. The dynamic range is much more narrower than regular paper. I spray the living daylights out of this. If you look at it in person, it's reasonably good enough. I mean, it, is, it has, this is a lot darker than what you see on, on, on the monitor. On the monitor, it looks really super dull. It really is not that bad when you see it in person. I've sold several of these and people absolutely love them. But anyway, this paper has no protection to gases, attack from gases. Now, did I really have to do that? That was done on the Pro 1000 with pigment inks. Probably not. I probably did not have to do that. But spraying them with a protectant spray seemed to deepen the color saturation a little bit. It, it actually made a visual change to it. And so in that case, that's a change that I, you know, w welcome. Um, did it make it glossy? Of course not. Did it keep the matte look? Of course it did. So again, if you are printing on RC shiny papers, you want something that's not going to make it even more shiny or shinier or dull it down. If that's what you, if you want shiny look, it doesn't dull it down. It keeps the same amount of gloss. On a, on a Burrita paper, which is a very delicate gloss, you don't want it to become and make it look like a luster print, right? So you have to have a spray that will no longer, not only protect your surface by sealing it so that the ink is no longer exposed to the oxidizing gases in the air, and as well as UV protection if you need it. In a lot of situations, we really don't need it. Our incandescent bulbs don't produce a lot of UV, okay? Certain types of fluorescent bulbs tend to. And I've had uh, situations where I had stuff at work on my wall, my little cubicle where I worked, and that stuff just did not last very long. And I had a big, big bright window facing west. And also, you know, glass is supposed to absorb a lot of UV, even the cheapest glass. Well, no, my prints faded like that at work, but never did at home. So environment also tends to have a, a huge factor. The paper is an even larger factor for longevity. Your RC coated papers with OBAs will fade a lot quicker than a nice rag burrita art paper. Ten times more longevity probably. If you really want to look at that, look at Ardenberg's uh, website. All they do is light exposure, so they're only measuring the effects of light on printed photos on different papers, different inks, different printers. But yeah, it, it's, it's amazing what a difference a paper will make when it comes to longevity. These sprays are not cheap. They are expensive. They cost about $20 for a little 12-ounce can. So use them sparingly, but use them well. I spray the front if it's just an RC print because the back is also coated with resin. So it's not going to allow any, any um, gases to permeate. But the upper surface of the coated paper is porous. So it does allow gases to enter. Seal it on the surface. That's all you have to do. On a paper such as the watercolor paper, which is just fiber-based, the gases can freely enter through the back, seal both sides. That's going to require twice the amount of spray, but it will protect your prints. If you are printing on a good third-party pigment ink set and you're selling your prints, make sure you protect them. And make sure you tell the buyer that you are using a third-party, well-established you know, ink set. The reason my prints don't cost $1,000 each, but only $300 each, is because this, this, and this. What I'm giving you, extra protection that will then bring that longevity level closer to what OEM would be, the expensive ink would be, simply by using a spray. It works. It really does work.
do they all fade at the same rate? No, they do not. Again, that comes into the makeup of the particular paper. If a paper has a component that will cause, cause or expedite the effects of ozone, then, yeah, that paper really should not be used for anything you want to last unless you can seal it, okay? So, yeah, different rates for different papers. Okay. Rahab from Israel, uh, Pro 1000 moved from PC to Incal. Going to take a long time to see the difference. Yes, it will. Yes, indeed, it will. A very long time. Um, remember that PC, okay, was using original yellow, red, and blue, as well as the chroma optimizer. So you're going to see a difference in in some of those colors that that have to do with those three main colors. And you're going to see a difference in your gloss as well, okay? And I know you have no choice because, you know, PC simply doesn't ship. At least they don't physically ship. They have some other uh, third-party shipping company ship to other countries, but it costs a lot more. And so, yeah, you're going to see a difference, but it takes a long time. Hopefully, it'll be a nice gradual difference. In cowl, it's not that bad. The difference between the original, I tested it. I tested it on a, um, what was it? I think I did it on the Pro 10, sort of. Um, I had no other choice. Uh, I tested the inks in, you know, the OEM red from OEM, from, from third-party red to OEM red. Because that's the first color that he changed. I know what I did. I'm sorry. Let me back up. Pro 10 had OEM red. I did the full third-party set of 10 inks, including Chrome Optimizer, for the Pro 10. Then I did the full set of 10 inks, but with OEM red ink. Ah, it wasn't really that dramatic. Some images required it, maybe. But in most cases, you just didn't really see it like day and night difference. So hopefully that won't be the, the the same with the Pro 1000, even though you went from four OEM now to third party. Okay. Hopefully it will not be a huge like drop in quality. Michael says, I just got QImage update for life. Great printing program. So did you buy it outright or did you upgrade? How did you do that? Because I know someone wanted to know how to do that. And maybe you can, but not with my affiliate. Maybe that's that's the way you do it. So who asked me earlier? Um, yeah, Jerry. So maybe you can update, but you just won't give me the the little extra help if you will that i would normally get all right a lot of people are converting or wondering converting this is what we're going to talk about if printers can be converted to direct to film inks now i'm not hugely familiar with this process but i think uh, basically what it means that rather than going back in time and stepping back into the dark room where you're using film negatives to print either by contact, that means one-to-one, -one, or by enlargement, meaning you're projecting it onto a sheet of um, photosensitive paper, you could do that in the computer. You can actually maybe scan a negative how would you do that? You create a printed transparent film negative and then go into the darkroom and print that. I think that's what these people are doing. But as far as the conversion of the printer goes, 
you would probably be then using a old black system. Uh, although you can probably get away with just regular inks because if, if you can print a monochrome print and have it be neutral with your regular ink set, why couldn't you do that even if it is a negative, a reversed image onto film? Okay, If you could do that on paper and stay linearly neutral from black to white with no changes in hue, then you should be able to do that on film. But I guess if you really want to be a purist, you would go ahead and choose and, and swap your ink set for an all black system. Just like, for example, like a, a cone color. I, would, I discussed that a little bit way back. <clears throat> they have um, all ink systems, but they are basically pigment based and they are meant for Epson printers. And that allows you to print extremely high quality black and white prints from your you know monochrome images that you converted to black and white those inks will come in different levels of neutrality so one ink set will be perfectly neutral and the printer believe me there's no color management the printer will produce a neutral result you use a rip software to print no longer will be using your driver any longer so you use this uh, quad tone rip. I think Mike uh, Cheney touched on that a little while ago, two weeks ago. But anyway, yeah, so you can use that and then print your negative image onto a sheet of transparent inkjet receptor um, film. Let it dry. Go to the darkroom. Put that on top of a piece of photo paper in your light box. Expose it and develop it as you normally would. Is that what they're doing? I assume that's what they're doing. So yeah, is it possible? Of course it is. It, it is entirely possible. Not, not something that's, you know, <clears throat> cannot be done. But, you know, to me, that's like, you really want to go back in time. You just really want to do that badly in order to go through the extremes of setting up a printer just for that. Yeah. Yes, you can update your image to lifetime. Just no, yeah, that's what he told me. That's not, he did tell me there is no um, discount, double discount. So during Black Friday, you'll still get your discount, but you're not going to get a double piggyback discount. I think that's what he means by that. Let's see. I had jotted down a topic, Canon printers and their maintenance procedures. What was I going to talk about in that subject? Cleaning cycles? Nozzle checks? That's about it. But just today, okay, and just two days ago, I did an nozzle check, my Pro 1000. By the way, ask questions, because I only got three more topics to talk about. So ask questions. Uh, I'm going to do a demo on Photoshop about uh, soft proofing. Give you a little quick demo about that. I just did a video that I uploaded uh, yesterday. You guys, that's going to be a little bit more detail. But anyway, um, <clears throat> just before I started, like eight minutes before the uh, show went live, I began a nozzle check on my printer. I did it directly off of the screen. And the first thing it did was it sounded like a little machine gun. Like that. That is the internal agitation. So... Each compartment that is right behind, I think it's, I don't know where the actual locations are, but there are little pistons that move back and forth. They start off slow, faster, and faster, and they agitate the ink. They suck it and push it. It's like a syringe 
doing this like that and that resuspends pigment now be aware that these inks are so well formulated that the basically the little pigment granules microscopic pigment granules are neutrally buoyant they just float but in time they could settle especially the different colors they have different weights they have different properties sure they're ground to a specific diameter give or take so that they don't clump up inside that tiny little nozzle okay so it did that for a while then it went silent when it's going silent is when it's performing the nozzle uh the so-called um cleaning cycle and then it makes noise that's the pump the head already detached and the pump is just sucking away or pulling away the liquid ink from the perch unit while the printhead is sitting and sealed on the perch unit it's a very quiet application of vacuum you don't hear anything okay and it then detaches moves out of the way a little bit and the peristaltic pump begins to work and it's a whirling type noise nee, 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 like that that's what you hear that's what you associate with a cleaning cycle that pump duration pumping duration is like 10 times longer than the actual sucking of the little bit of ink out of the uh, printhead. It's going to just suck ink out of the printhead until it believes it is unclogged. Okay. Another thing that you might experience, and it depends because there is a choice in the maintenance tab in the printer to disable auto nozzle check. Don't do that. Oh, you think you're disabling nozzle checks. You think you're disabling cleaning cycles. Don't do that. Leave that on. Believe me, leave that on. Here's what happens. And you might be wondering, what in the world is this printer doing? You haven't printed for, say, three weeks. Or you had your printer off, even worse. You power it back on or you send a job after a couple of weeks of non-use it does that cleaning cycle blah 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 and then it'll just go and you open up the uh, lid and you're wondering what the hell is going on and you see the printhead just sitting almost all the way to the right but just doing and it's doing it forever and you go like oh god this thing is wasting all my ink no it's not wasting any ink well a tiny amount what it is doing is performing the auto nozzle check there's a little trough there is a a, a sensor each nozzle okay let me show you again you see two rectangular vertical nozzle plates with six no in this case five vertical rows they're microscopic i cannot get close enough to show you okay so each one of those vertical rows has a number of nozzles how many i have no clue each nozzle fires and that nozzle when it fires that droplet goes into a draw into a little trough it's part of the wasting system folks and it will determine the sensor will determine how does this work i have no idea the sensor will determine that that nozzle is 100 percent clear it actually spit out the proper volume of ink next nozzle tick, tick, tick. one after the other it's going to take forever because there's 12 rows of those nozzles. Okay. Once it is done verifying that, then it knows all the nozzles are clean. So that that's one of the little mysteries that I wonder what the hell it was doing. And Mike just explained that to me on a phone call. And I thought, you have got to be kidding me. No wonder it takes so long. So be aware of that. Uh, normally, if you are not, Letting your printer sit for a month, it will not perform that, okay? 
it will not. But do not disable it. Do not disable it. Because that's what is going to then assign a basically a, a, a nozzle that's not being used, a redundant nozzle for that job to replace that one. How is it doing that? Again, the magic, the magic of these printers. So do not disable that function because then you will not be able to get a redundant nozzle reassigned to that to replace the one that was not firing correctly. The printer does not want you to have a job that you print that does not print correctly. It's doing all of this in the background for you. You might think it's unnecessary, but it is necessary. Epson does not provide you with that level of technology. It just simply does not, okay? In order for you, because Epson printers have cold firing nozzle, PSO crystal technology, the print heads are tough as nails. They're tanks compared to Canon print heads. Canon print heads are tough too, but they just cannot compare to Epson. So Epson doesn't do any of that. Epson expects you to perform all your maintenance yourself. You do a nozzle check. Oh, I'm missing a couple of run a cleaning cycle. And oh, by the way, it's global. You cannot do it by zones like you can on Canon. So you see what I mean? Do not complain too much about Canon printers, folks. They they have a lot of built-in technology that is simply not available elsewhere. Any news on opening a Canon cartridge? Yeah, I just talked about that. I just talked about that earlier. Uh, it's very difficult to do it properly. You can do a butcher job, but it's not going to help you reuse it. They are very smart. They created the internal compartments of that cartridge. It's not just it's not just like this. It's not just like this. This is a repacked one. This is for Epson. You take the lid off, it just pops out. Rip out the insides and put the new ones in and reset it. You're set. Not this. There are a several dozen little compartments in high, inside here. Each layer is like somebody took a die and cut. Imagine my hand, but triple. Triple the fingers. It fits in all those little tiny crevices. I cannot just cut out this part and expect to pull out all of the internal absorbent material. You just cannot. You cannot interfere with this. This is where the ink goes in. This is a breather. On the bottom is a solid layer of absorbent material. On the top layer, again, you have all those little walls. It's not easy. Believe me, I have the capabilities to do this, but I kind of gave up on it. I thought, okay, this is too much work for a regular person that doesn't have the machinery that I have. It's going to be a pain. If you can go, if we can go back to having this available for $14.99, that's, that's the best way to go. That's the best way to go. If you saw my resetting demonstration, that resetter is $90. PC sent it to me. He gave up on it as well. Actually, his Pro 1000 died. Yep. Oscar says, uh, do you recommend ink out for Canon 10S? Since you say S, that means you're in uh, Europe. Then the answer is sure. If you're in the um, UK, uh, uh, octoinc.co.uk also top of the line um, they they provide you with the generic ink set made by probably image specialists okay not the tweaked one that pc provides you that's the difference i keep hammering on that okay yeah he could also buy the the standard product for the pro 10 that image specialist puts out but it doesn't quite match OEM output. So he had them tweak it. Should the company that makes that ink, Image Specialist, 
provide the world with a tweaked ink? No, no, no. See, PC has the rights on that one. Okay. So he went through the trouble of formulation, of blending, and then finally achieving almost a perfect match color-wise, okay, to OEM. As far as gamut, maybe not. Maybe not as big as OEM. Slightly less, but as long as you can provide accurate color rendition, you're good to go. So, yeah. But if you're in Europe, then, yeah, Ink Owl, um, octoinkjet.co, octoinkjet.co.uk. I believe they can ship through the uh, European Union as well. Jaroslaw Jelinski. Jaroslaw Jelinski. Um, hello from Poland. I watch your channel regularly. Lots of art, practical advice. I print on Epson SCP 800. Thank you for your advice. Awesome. That's a great printer, man. I am running, um, for those who do not know, I am running refillable cartridges on that one. How can I do that? I'm, I live in the U.S. I have one of the early versions of the chip decoder board, which had to be installed internally. It was a pain in the you-know-what. So they are, um, the, the chip readers are totally disconnected. They no longer read the cartridge chips. The chips are embedded into the electronic board. And so that's where they get that uh, color information from. And there are 30 resets. Originally, I'm down to 20. I have 28 left. That means anytime one single cartridge is declared empty, even though it is not. And by the way, you have to make sure that you always top, and top them off. Always top them off. Uh, never allow a cartridge to go physically empty. That is a nightmare that you do not want to happen. So top them off. And for me, once a, say, Matt Black just recently did that, okay, after when I was switching inks, yeah, that's what he pulled on me and also filled this up with ink. So I had to switch that, reset it, switch to a new one, and then swap back to this one so that the chip would be recognized. Go back and listen to that again if you want to know. Um, it's a system that the PA-100 uses and... 3880 and 3800 for chip recognition for the maintenance cartridges. So let's see. Da, 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 da. He is in the UK, I believe he said. Yeah. So yeah, just check out uh, um, Ink Owl if you want to, or uh, my friend Martin from Octo Inc. All right, I think that's it for now. We got 47 people watching. Let me go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about somebody. Somebody did this, and, and they were, like, racking their brain as to why this was happening. And I used to have this on. I, was, I, I thought I had it on Facebook available here. Let me see if I can find it again. Let me scroll down here. It's a very common problem with a simple cost, actually. Gee. Was it this one? Let me keep going here. I got to find this so that you guys can see what I'm talking about. Gee, did he delete it? I think maybe he might have deleted it. Oh, why would anyone do that? Yeah, I think it's gone. Anyway, what it was... was a shot that contained 
a very large spans of sky. And because of the time of day or whatever the situation was, we had a very gradual, almost angular transition between a darker value of whatever that cyan or mix of cyan and blue was to the lower right horizon of this image. And he saw what he called banding. I looked at the image, which is now gone, unfortunately, and it wasn't banding. Banding is caused, it's a mechanical artifact, okay? That's caused by your printhead misalignment. And it will show up as horizontal bands that move with the printhead direction. In other words, we normally print in portrait mode. So long, long part of the paper sits like this. And the narrow part is where it enters the printer. You will see mechanical banding in this direction. It could be caused by several nozzles not firing. It can be caused by head misalignment as well. But this wasn't that. This was like this. Like little areas of... of Density, like abrupt density changes, like layers. It almost looked like it was done on a paint, paint by number painting. Remember those where they actually had delineated areas and, you know, number 37, and you get your little bottle of number 37 paint and you fill that in with that. And you see this jumps in hue from one, not a straight like line, but something like that it's posterization that's what that is and it occurs because most images printed on a windows machine cannot be higher than eight bit so what happens is that the total value between this sector of sky was say let's call it 250 now let's call it uh 140 like midway, 140. And then, yeah, it can fill that area with 140, no problem. And then the next one is 145. You will see a delineated a, a wall between 140. And then the next one was about 140 and a half, but there is no 140 and a half. There's only 141. So that's why I created that very irregular little border. It's like if you took a mountain and you cut it into layers and you see this, you know, and each layer is slightly different shape. Yeah. yeah. Weird. It's a weird effect called posterization. And that was done in the psychedelic days of the 60s. Posters were made that way. But in imaging, it occurs because of bit rate. Oh, but this was a 47 megabyte. It does, I don't care how big it was. It's 8 bit. Okay. And that graduated sky was so gradual had it been more a, a quicker stronger transition you probably would not even notice it but because it was like maybe maybe like just four values across that whole sky same value same value oh i gotta switch over to it's one more oh i gotta switch over to the other there was no in between so you know i would solve that if the original image was made in 16-bit and say you printed it on a Mac, which can maintain 16-bit printing, you can actually use it. Windows will always downgrade it to 8-bit, but you can use QImage. QImage will simulate perfectly, magically, 16-bit printing. And I guarantee you that if you have that problem between those two zones, irregularly shaped areas of the sky that happen to just the only difference being one value one point between 0 to 55 say 140 141 it will create a 140 and a half and it will blend that a lot better so you will not have that area of almost you see it because it's such an abrupt change had it been a bunch of detail you would not see it but it's just blank sky so it will show up it will become visible and you will see it so you need something that will then dither create 
what is not there. Another half tone between those two values. And it's not going to completely eliminate it, but it's going to make it so much less apparent that you may not even notice it. Another way you can get rid of something like that, say you don't have Q image, add a tiny bit of grain. Go back to the old film days and add a little bit of film grain to it. Yeah, it'll have a tiny little bit of texture. That texture will just obliterate that little irregular wall where it changes from this tonal value to the next tonal value. It'll go away. But Q image is a lot easier. And you won't have to use green, <laughs> fake green. All right, let's go ahead and jump into Photoshop. Let me open up, open up Photoshop. Let me minimize this. I don't need that anymore. And I can minimize that one. I hope I don't stress out my computer too much. We got an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. I hope I can last that long. Photoshop is opening up. We're going to talk about gamut warning. And of course, the reason why this was even brought up. No okay, kidok. So we are in Photoshop. Let's see one guy here. Oscar says, yes, I am in the UK. Yeah. So, yeah, I got to you. Yeah. So I, you might want to contact um, Octo Inc. They're also very good. All right. Let's enlarge this a bit. So let's look at what the standard image looks like in Photoshop, first of all. And the, the, the whole question arose because somebody said, well, many people all the time, constantly saying that they're not getting a perfect representation of what they see on the screen. It's not that it's a color cast. It's not that. It's just that, for instance, this red is not as red as you see it on your monitor. So let's first cover what you need to achieve in order to make your editing of your images mean something. Otherwise, it's completely meaningless. You may be spending hours editing your images it means squat. Why? Your image is not being displayed correctly on your monitor. Out of the box, absolutely will not be displayed correctly. Okay? So it needs to be calibrated. Take a look. I hope this video stream gives it the proper level of accuracy. But if you take a look at this standard image, it looks perfect, doesn't it? It does not have a color cast. Look at this ramp, okay? It does not have a color cast. Let me go. Let me go to my selection right here. Okay. So let's go to Windows and Histogram. And we'll pop that over there. It pops up on my main screen. Let's go ahead and pop this over here. All right, unlike every one of your images, you're not going to have this even histogram, okay? Have a look at that. It's not absolutely even throughout, but it has detail on the dark zones and the, and the black. Right here, this is pure black. Right here, this is two above black and four and eight and so forth. 6 and 8 and 10 and 12 and so forth. But look at this. Such an even distribution of tones. Okay. So this is what you need to look at. Not only for figuring out whether a normal image, and I don't mean something that's meant to be a high key image. For instance, a model dressed in a white gown against a very light studio background. That would be high key. 
most of the tones are going to live in this region here okay how about a dark dog in a dark room you know uh, with a with a flashlight in his mouth well that's going to be a low key the only bright thing is going to be the flashlight <clears throat> the majority of the tones are going to re side in this area here if you have a landscape for instance and most of the predominant tones are mid then you will have your range right around this middle area here with some highlights and some shadows but most of the tones will be residing along the middle of the histogram so this represents black all the way to white zero all the way to 255 okay now this electron micrograph it's a scanning electron micrograph is perfectly neutral look at from the brightest to the darkest and everything in between neutral the this looks like down in arizona somewhere well look at it you got a nice gradual transition fall trees i think these are probably um either birch or as i think it's birch again this looks normal to you you look at it look at these babies look at the skin tones there's no color cast in these skin tones look at the shadows areas of their faces there is no color cast in them it looks normal this is an image that has been used for ages to serve as a as a uh, control again it looks normal strawberries they really look red like they're supposed to a sunset which is mostly yellows browns and oranges again you can imagine psychologically imagine that image in your head and it looks perfect this is a bunch of i think lava flow for all you know of all things it has a lot of different uh, colors in it as well let me let me zoom in you can see a lot of blues magenta uh, cyans and blacks now let's look at the reds real close deep reds blacks over here blacks over here tiny little bit of white there somewhere again it looks normal this bunch of computer stuff here and uh, players mostly you know a lot of monochrome values here some rainbow colors here again this looks normal you you look at this and you you don't think oh this has a color cast right oh sorry this is also black we can do uh, info and we can float over this look at the values right here check out right here look at the values zero 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 right let's look at this gray so this gray is uh what is it 266 no 256 no that cannot be once 156 something like that it's hard to read 186 186 186 so that's actually very neutral throughout and then we can go ahead and jump over to the electron micrograph i told you this was neutral throughout look at the numbers they remain the same okay now let's look at these down here so let's hover over this one two 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 so that is one step above black two 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 now four should be four 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 six eight if he was six ten and eight they would not be neutral you see what i mean so this is being displayed by my monitor perfectly so i can rely on the way my monitor is displaying this control image fully and what does that mean to me as a as an image editor that I can then trust what I see. I can trust that my images that I load onto Photoshop, if that's all I have, 
are being displayed correctly. So then my editing means something. Otherwise, it means nothing. Okay. If this has a color shift that I cannot see with my eyes because I got used to it, it means nothing. That means when I then correct something, I'm actually adding instead of subtracting or subtracting rather than adding or brightening rather than darkening. You know what I mean? So there's 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 no reason why if you have not properly calibrated your monitors, you should even consider printing. Really, there isn't because it would be just a nightmare for you. And this is where the majority of problems comes up with. People come up with, my prints are too dark. Of course they're too dark. You know why they're too dark? Because they are dark. The images are dark. That's why they are being printed dark. Simple. If your monitor is correctly set for brightness, that image that I just looked at, this beautiful image right here, should be displayed correctly. And when you look at this, you should see that as black. When you look at that, you should see that as white. Okay? Simple as that. Let's take a look at this. This is uh, 255, 255, 255. And it looks white. Zero, zero, zero. And it looks black. Let's look at red. Look at that. These colors are ridiculous, by the way. All right, enough about that. Let's go ahead and jump in to gamut warning. Now, if I print this, and these colors don't quite come out right, these colors right here, look at how ridiculously bright and neon-like these colors come out on your monitor. They're being displayed with a backlit monitor. Prints are viewed from a front reflective light viewing system. Light falls on the print and it bounces back through the layers of ink and attempts to give you the same level of brilliance that you see on your monitor? Impossible. No way in you know what that's going to happen. Your monitor will always display your images brighter, more intense, more pop, more lively, whatever you want to use as a term than you will see on paper. Paper by nature is dull. Monitors are bright. Okay. Transitions from super saturated on the top to either black or to white. You are looking for banding. Let's, let's get I see some. See, this is my monitor introducing that. There seems to be a tiny bit. I'm looking at this on a cheap monitor, by the way, on the side, my second monitor, not my good monitor. You look for this area here to have any kind of, well, any kind of banding. And so far, so good. No banding, at least in those areas. But I did see some here, right there and right here. A little tiny bit. Okay, you will see that manifest itself when you print it. I hit the crop by mistake. Let's take, get rid of that. I don't want to crop. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to enlarge it. Oh, enlarge it. I don't want to do that. Anyway, let's leave it like that. And... Uh, that's what happens when you're working for, on another monitor and you're looking at a secondary secondary monitor. Let's go ahead and look at this under under uh, so-called gamma warning. And to do that, you go to you go to your view tab on the other screen. Silly view tab and gamma warning or Shift Control Y. Let's go ahead and use Shift Control Y instead. It'll be different on a Mac. Oh my gosh, look what happens. All of the areas that became gray are out of gamut, just totally out of gamut. Cannot be reproduced correctly. That doesn't mean they're gonna disappear. That doesn't mean they're gonna be printed gray. That just means that they're gonna be compressed in order to make them fit into the normal, what most printers gamut will be, okay? So 
So you can see right there. Let's go ahead and enlarge, say, this area here. We'll see what happens within this portion of the image when you view it under gamut warning. See all the little yellow leaves that turn gray? They're just simply too bright. They're, they're beyond the capability of a printer to be able to reproduce them at that level of intensity, if you will. See that? That includes some of the greens. That includes some of the yellows as well. Let's move that over to the shot of the, uh, I think that's the Grand Canyon possibly. And there you go. The whole sky just simply cannot be. And some of the shadow areas, these regions right here. This one is okay. That's not affected, but this one here. What will happen is that these two zones will blend together and will appear as just one tone. Where in reality, this is a little bit brighter than this. Watch what happens here. This is a little bit brighter than this. It just goes away. Okay. So it'll be there. It will be printed. It'll just be darker. You will not see the level of detail that you might possibly be able to see here. Let's go to this. This is more of a normal. Uh, it's not supposed to be that demanding. Let's see what happens. Yeah. See, not much change there. Not much change. So this basically represents probably a very normal image. Look at that. Nothing is happening. Maybe a few colors here in this in this uh, Macbeth color chart, but nothing much. Let's look at the transition. Oh, let's look at the babies. Nothing happens with the babies. They're in gamut. So this should print exactly like you see it. Let's look at the uh, micrograph. This is what I was telling you. If you convert something to monochrome, it will be in gamut, in, out, in, out. No problem. Now, now here's the fun stuff. All of those upper layers right here, and this one will be out of gamut. Let me go back to the select tool. There we go. Here we go. Gone. Notice the black ramp, black to white, does not get affected. Let's look at the sunset. You edit your sunset to look that fantastic, and then what happens? You lose some of it. What about the lava flow? Oh, look at the strawberries. Shadow areas are just simply too much. See that? Too much. That area here, it's too much. It cannot handle it. Look at the lava flow. Some areas, not much, some areas will be affected. Right here, you will get a, see, this is posterization. You will get that line of demarcation. Yeah. All right, so that's what happens under this very basic way of viewing whether your colors are in or out of gamut. Let's, let's use a more um, correct method, if you will, of examining and at least give you an idea what your your uh, image is going to look like. Let me go ahead and close this. I don't want to save it. I'm going to reopen it. All right, so let's go ahead and view this under soft proofing. So what we will do is go back to the View tab and Proof Setup Custom. Let me take this over to the other monitor. We'll be presented with this. And what I have done, because recently I've been using my XP15000 with a really, really excellent paper. Hang on. A sub photo paper. That's what I printed that nice um, superhero print on. And we'll view this image under those conditions as well. I want you to look at the lady with the the uh, red and black dress. You see how the red dress has different areas of red, different shades of red. Remember that. And then this lady here, her 
pants are slightly greenish and her top is a little bit more darker and neutral. Okay, keep that in mind. Because this is where people get really picky about color rendition. Okay, so let's go ahead and check this out. So this is that same paper, XP15000, but with a profile that I created. So I created a custom profile. Black point compensation has been set. I'm not going to use the simulate paper color because it really exaggerates the results. Let's go ahead and view this under preview. Well, how about I go over there and do it? There you go. On, off. Look what happened to these colors, folks. This is under soft proofing. See, preview has been turned on. This is what it's going to print like. It's not going to print like that. It cannot. Inks are not neon. Inks are inks. This is the best they can do on that particular paper, even with a custom profile. Let me move out of the way a little bit. Wish I could make this smaller, but I cannot. I want you to look at the strawberries. Not much change. You see that? So it, it seems to be okay. That profile, custom profile, was able to bring in a lot of these tones that when you looked at them under gamma warning, showed a change. And you can see lighter, darker, right here. Take a look at this right here. Darker, lighter, darker, lighter. Let me show you what black point compensation will do. Again, the same thing. With black point compensation turned on, you may end up blocking maybe steps zero through six. Yeah, you'll get a more intense black that way, but you will not have tonal separation if it exists in that dark region, okay? So I always suggest, look what happens here. With it on, I open up the shadows. With it off, see right here, there's detail. Look, look, look. Right there, there's detail. It's gone. Look at the posterization. You see that? That is a great example of posterization. Bad. Not so bad. Blocked. Open. Okay? If that doesn't sell you, nothing else will. Let's look at the transition of the sky. Off. On. You see how it just lost that a little bit, but it's not that bad. It actually, it actually helped out the clouds a bit. Check it out. That is just straight view of what the monitor can display. This is what the printer will produce. I prefer that, if you ask me. It simply looks better. It almost has more detail. Let's add. Black point compensation, oh, even better. All right, so that is what gamma, not gamma, but um, uh, soft proofing will do. You're using a profile intended for that paper, intended for that printer, intended for that ink set, okay? Keep in mind, if your image contains colors like these, they're not gonna be reproduced. Like you see them, absolutely not. Look what happens here. This is quite drastic at the the um, area with the transitions. All that neon look goes away. There's hardly any difference in tonality change here. It cannot be because from this point up, it went neon. And papers do not have neon qualities. They just do not. All right, let's go ahead and look at some other image. Let me close that. Let me open up the superhero image that we were working on. And this is what I wanted to show you guys. So here's the one that I just showed you a print off. Let's go ahead and do a gamut warning. See that area there does not really show much change. Look at the whole image. Oh, right here. So 
right here, these areas here were a little bit beyond the capability of most printers. Let's check to see if we have any more grayish areas. Not too much. Now, that means that this image, the way it is edited, will be able to be reproduced almost in their entirety. Let's do something really silly. Let's go ahead and let me see if I can even see it because this live counter clicker here is in the way. Let me move this like that so I can access image, adjustments, and hue and saturation. Okay, I'm gonna increase the saturation while I am in gamut warning. Look what happened to the, to, you know, other areas are just be like this area here. Let's leave it there fully saturated. And I'm gonna go to on off. Look at the, the guy's purple pants right here. Totally out of gamut. Purples, blues, deep science will lose the ability to be reproduced a lot quicker than reds, yellows, magentas. I don't know why, but people often see problems with skies, uh, seascapes, that type of thing, deep purples in flowers that just tend to go haywire. Let's go ahead and go back to the normal saturation and we will go ahead and view this under soft proofing. Here we are, soft proofing again. Let's move this over here. Right there is a good place. And this is on, this is off, on, off. Check here, view this area here, view this area here. Oh, let me get out of gamut warning. Here we go. Okay. Let's do this. Black point is on. In preview. Remember, this is a... a um, why am I still under gamut warning? Take that off. Got to make sure that you get your... Yeah, warning is off. Okay. So now let's go ahead and do the soft proofing and q image has soft proofing as well so the slide room okay so let, let's have a look let's have a look remember the area that was showing out of gamma see this is this is the way the computer displays it this is the way it will be printed period the way the computer displays it the way it is printed let's look at the purple the the do with the purple pants Right there. Okay, on, off. Not much. Look at this right here. Remember, I, I show you that. I think that's as far as I can move it. I think it froze. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Yeah, it froze. Anyway. Let's go back to me. I knew that that was not going to last too long. But anyway, so that gives you a really good idea. What, what will happen when you try to print something? And do not be surprised when you don't get what you see. It, it just happens. Let me go ahead and close Photoshop. It's sucking up all my memory and such. Yeah, CPU use and all that good stuff. All right, so that's what happens. Let me add my screen back on. Here's the deal. Backlit monitors can show you colors that do not exist in prints, period. So don't be fooled when you see, and this could be because you over-edited that image and your enthusiasm to make that 
sunset looked amazing, where it doesn't look natural at all anymore. See, that's the whole deal, the natural look. And I, I wanted to show you, let me see if I can reopen and uh, show you one last demo here, because this was important. The diorama that I made uh, contained this one image. Let me see if I can get away with doing this one more time here. Pop that over there. All right, stay with me now. I'm telling Photoshop. <laughs> we'll open up the diorama. This is a pretty big image. Large, large image. It is a 27,000. Oh, no, that's inches. Sorry. <laughs> 27 inches by... Let me change it to pixels. I wanted to give you the pixel dimension. Come on now, don't freeze on me again. Okay, well, inches. It prints to 10 by 10.8 by 27 inches. But let's go ahead and do the 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 um, gamut warning. Nothing. Nothing. So that, that shows you that this image is printable. Let's go to custom. Preview. Let's get out of the way here. Let me zoom back. I want you to take a look and see if anything happens. On, off, on, off. There's a little bit of change right here. Tiny bit right there. Actually opens it back up. It opens that area for more detail. So this image requires no help. I can I cannot do better than this. The way I edited it was to make sure I had a black point and I had a white point and all of the tonality fell in between. Let's check that. Let's check the histogram. So view, I think, Windows and Histo. And we'll pop that over there. Here's my histogram. So a lot of blue, OK, because of the greenery and shadow areas. So this is just no whites anywhere, hardly. See that? So there's not a predominance of tones here. But most of it lives in the central portion of the histogram with some dark areas. I mean, there's some dark areas here, here, here represented. And so that's a pretty good tonal distribution right there. So yeah, I, I can print this and it comes out just the way I see it on my monitor because nothing exceeds the ability of the printer. This image has been basically edited to fit the capabilities of the XP 15,000. And of course, since I am using a custom profile, that always helps as well. All right. So I hope this kind of, you know, gives you a, a good idea what to expect when you print something. And do not be shocked by the fact that what you see on your screen basically cannot be represented with most available, today's available ink sets and papers. It's impossible. Once you accept that, that's, that's the thing. You need to get over the fact that it's just simply impossible. You're not gonna get that kind of um, neon quality unless somebody invents inks that have that capability, that extra, maybe, um, if you view them under a certain color temperature light or UV light, it will give you that, you know, that look. But no, it just, I mean, they do have UV lights, um, UV inks. But I don't think they're suitable for photographic printing, let me tell you. So the current batches of even OEM, whether they are OEM, third party, top quality, whatever inks, cannot 
duplicate what you see on your monitor. If what you see on your monitor exceeds the limits of your printer's gamut. Keep that in mind. Once you get over that and you know you learn how to edit to stay within that limitation, use gamut warning, lose, use soft proofing, and you will be able to then at least get a much closer match. You'll be a much happier printer, if you will. So if you see, say, for instance, I didn't show you this because I don't want to crash my computer, but sometimes. If you are not using a custom profile, which maximizes the printer's gamut, basically, okay, excuse me, for a particular paper and ink that you're using on it, you're using a generic profile from the paper manufacturer, and that's meant to work with every single XP 15,000, okay, not necessarily yours. There's a big difference about that. You have to make your own profile yourself to extract the maximum quality out of your particular unit that was assembly line made, okay? They cannot all be tested. Only a handful of them are tested, okay? So you do not know where your output sits when you compare it to what the factory intended it to be, okay? You cannot internally calibrate that printer like a Pro 1000. That brings it to a factory spec. Perfect, perfect output. No, you have to rely on a profile. So once you do that and your monitor is calibrated properly, then you perform your soft proofing. If you're using a Canon paper or an Epson paper and an Epson profile, and you see a, a larger drastic change in the look before, this is what it looks like in your monitor. This is what it's going to look like when you print it. If it's something really truly drastic and oh wow that really looks crappy dull now well you know that's all that profile can do possibly okay you can take that image while it is being viewed under soft proofing and manipulate it a little bit increase the the saturation a little bit while you are looking at it under soft proofing condition not when soft proofing is off because it will look oversaturated then. But you can adjust certain aspects of the image, increase the contrast a little bit. Maybe you don't like the way it opened up the shadows. Maybe you want the shadows blocked. Maybe you want posterization. Well, I wouldn't. But you, you saw what I just demonstrated to you. You saw it happen. So you can adjust. You can change color balance slightly. Even if it causes a shift, oh, my God, you would not, you know, you would not want that to happen. But if it does then yeah, you got a bad profile. But if it does, you can at least change the tint, let's just say, adjust the hue. And while you are soft proofing through that profile, that's what it's gonna look like when you print it. When you leave soft proofing, your image is gonna look wrong. You know, In order to trust soft proofing, however, your monitor has to be perfectly calibrated. And that standard image has to look perfect on it. Not halfway decent, perfect. Okay. And I showed you how to how to um, basically analyze the image so that you can tell that things are being, you know, displayed correctly. Let's see what else we got here. I wanted to show you guys. I show you the uh, Pro 1000 driver the other day, but I wanted to show you a little bit about the P100. And I know that Mike was talking about advanced black and white. Mm. Because the P100 is, you know, nine color um, K3, what they call K3 printer. I wanted to touch on so-called advanced black and white. Let me close this. I don't need that open anymore. So we will not save it and boom. Okay, so 
I'm going to open up my P800. And again, remember, I am on Windows. So on a Mac, it's going to be a different UI. So here's my driver. And let's see. Da, 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 da. We're going to close this. No, we're going to minimize that. Okay, we are all set here. Okay. So normally when you are printing, you're going to be printing in a color mode. Right here. Color mode. And so basically that's going to ask you, uh, you want to print on Epson standard sRGB? Absolutely not. Never, ever, ever. Never, ever. I see them, folks. Not photo enhanced. Not any of these. Not Adobe RGB. I see them. ICM is going to automatically link a particular Epson paper you're using. And you got to be using Epson paper for this to work. A particular Epson paper you're using with its profile. That's that's installed in your printer. I mean, in your, uh, in your hard drive. So it's going to link it. You can tell your application to let the driver control color. Simple. Photoshop, print, I mean, file, print. Let driver control color. I'm using uh, ultra premium photo paper luster. Set it to ICM. Print. That's it. It's going to link it to that profile. Okay. You're printing in full color managed mode inside the driver, just like in Canon. You can do the same thing on a Canon printer. ICM. But now we're going to print black and white. Now you can print black and white using full RGB mode, but we're not. We're going to convert our image to a black and white, okay? To do that in Photoshop, it will maintain the RGB channels, but they will all, all be decolorized. The beauty about that is that you can actually use filtration to change the way, say, how bright do you want reds, areas that are red to be displayed? What shade of gray? What shade of gray do you want greens to be displayed? Yellows to be displayed. How about blues? So if you have a blue sky or cyan sky, you can reduce the cyan filter. And it will darken that sky for you. It will select it out and darken the sky. Red roses. You want those roses to look brighter? Adjust the red filter. And it will make those ro roses look a brighter shade of gray. You may end up with a situation where you have a green color and a red color that normally you will be able to differentiate between them. But they look the same value, the same value of gray. You can adjust that. That's what Hollywood did with black and white movies. They use filters over the lenses. Yeah. Did you know that um, women had to wear green lipstick because film back in those days, especially during the, the non-talky films, the silent movies, those films only saw what? Blue light. They did not see blue and green light. They did not see red light. So a lip that was painted with red lipstick would appear black. So they had to go with a green lipstick and that way they appear normal a grayish color like you know like red would have looked uh normally all right so let's you know for that let's go ahead and jump into black and white mode once we do that you are presented with neutral now you're not using a profile at all okay the printer is handling everything from now on so you're not using a profile so quality yeah we want quality Let's jump over to the advanced tab. This is what you will be presented with. So we remember we set it to neutral. Right there, neutral. On the color wheel, your selection will be set smack in the middle, neutral. If you look at the before 
This is what the image coming in is. This is what the print coming out will look like. Let's go ahead and light and, and make that reddish, greenish, or cyanish, green, yellow, magenta, blue. Well, we want neutral, so we'll leave it as zero and zero. Oops, I closed it, sorry. Let's go back to advanced. Now, one of the odd settings that they ask you to, to choose, because whatever for whatever the reason, it works, is to choose dark, okay? Do not choose anything else but dark. And then if you need to brighten your image, you can use your sliders. Make the image brighter. You see what's happening here in the example? Brighter, darker, or leave it where it was. Contrast. More contrast, less contrast. This is only affecting your output. Shadow detail. I don't see much difference there. So anyway, that is it. Uh, maximal, op what is it? Uh, optical density. And highest tonality. Let's see what happens. Not much difference there. Anyway, so. Once you hit print, you will get a perfectly neutral, whatever level of neutrality you chose. Again, if you guys have a Epson printer that has advanced black and white, and you specialize in just monochrome printing, take advantage of this. Don't use anything else. Believe me, even though when you put something side by side, RGB mode and advanced black and white mode, at first you may not see a big difference, but when you start examining areas where shadow detail that were like level zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, they will not be compressed. They'll be more open. You'll be able to see areas that would normally be crushed into one single tone. It's amazing. It's amazing. I love to use it, especially if I plan on printing several monochrome images. Why would I want to use something else when it's made available for you? And also, the Pro 1000 has a similar mode as well, just called black and white mode. You can access that, and you can do the same level of adjustments that you can on the Epson. And really, when you're printing on fine art papers and when you're printing on, on basically any paper, anything that's available there, um, you'll be able to then perfectly produce whatever, whatever the level of neutrality or lack of if you want to make a slightly sepia tone again just adjust your control you can actually choose sepia and it will automatically do a sepia but that may not be the level of sepia that you want sepia was something that we did to silver images with toners it made them last a very very long time almost almost turned them into an archival print Archival prints back then, it's a totally different thing than what we call archival prints now. Because every paper that was available until maybe the late 70s when RC resin coated papers came in, they came in for a reason. But prior to that, all papers were fiber based. They were just made out of wood fibers, maybe some cotton based papers as well but they all had a silver uh, halide layer. When you develop it, you end up with a image made out of tarnished silver particles. They look black. And then you'd have to dissolve away, remove the unprocessed, if you will, or unreduced silver chlorides, the silver salts. So remove the salts. You're left with paper with a coating on it in a silver-based image. If you let your silver, pure silver uh, coffee cup or fork tarnish, it'll turn black. So that's what you end up with. Your image is made out of silver particles. Problem was the hypo, the fixer, sodium thiosulfate, tenaciously adhered to wood fibers that made up your paper fiber. 
you could not wash it out completely. It took maybe hours to wash it out and hours of constant flow of water wasted a lot of water. So something after the, the movement, all of the ecological movements came into play in the 60s, they had to come up with a paper that could be washed quickly, resin coated. Hypo never entered the paper fibers. Hypo only attacked the surface, dissolved away the un, unreduced silver salts, removed them, a quick two minute wash, you didn't have silver. You didn't have any hypo, let's just say, left in the print itself. And that made it last a lot longer. What happened with the silver prints that had a little bit of hypo left in them? Eventually, the tarnish would go away. And the silver image, that black image, became almost like a mirror, like silver, like shiny silver. Really weird effect. I have some prints that actually have that. Uh, results, some very old uh, prints in our albums. So by washing the print for hours on end on a on a regular old-fashioned fiber paper that created a so-called um, what was the term? <laughs> I forgot the term. Type print, archival. Yes, archival print. And if you did it for a museum then you had to provide that kind of process. Now, they came up with a hypo eliminator, which was a chemical that sort of broke that bond between cellulose and sodium disulfate and allowed the salts to be removed, okay? And so that plus toning. Toning basically bleached out the silver, bleached it out, and replaced it with a, with a, a tone made out of some kind of sulfur type, uh, it's stinky, it smelled like rotten eggs uh, compound and gave you a very dark tone look. Uh, beautiful, beautiful look, kind of a slightly brownish look. And that made it even more uh, likely to last a lot longer. So archival involved all of these post treatments. For inkjet printing, it's different. It's just the inks. The inks that are affected, and if you have OBAs on your on your um, paper base, then that can also cause changes to take place. All that does, all that OBAs do, is they're a fluorescing agent, and they fluoresce under certain lights. The more UV a light has, the brighter that print will look. Whenever you see a paper and it has two different names, like Red River Aurora White. And Aurora Natural, Aurora Natural does not have OBAs. Aurora White does. And so that gives it a brighter look. Natural looks like a like a slightly warm paper base. Aurora White looks white. Epson also makes papers that are like that. So when you view them under the right type of light, they look brighter because that background fluoresces. Problem is that fluorescent agent burns out. And by burning out means it loses its ability to fluoresce. It will eventually turn back into a non-OBA uh, paper. And you may see the difference or you may not. So that's it. That by, uh, by itself causes a change in your print, what it looks like. So you can call that fading i don't know what i would call it but it does cause a change to take place the other kind of fading would be of course from uv light uh, you ever seen a car that has been sitting outside unprotected for 20 years it's no longer the shade it used to be of color right your clothes fade everything that uses dyes pigments fade pigments tend to fade a lot less because they are solid base and dyes are transparent dyes are more up to uh, oxidize on their ozone as well so some dyes require a mordant a mordant is a chemical that actually binds it to the cotton fibers of your genes for instance okay that's how that's how genes are dyed blue the the dye is actually yellow but it becomes blue with exposure to the air so 
it's funny. But anyway, everything will fade. Everything will eventually fade. Um, right now, I was in the process of uh, trying to save some of our old photographs. Again, in 10 more years, maybe they completely are gone. So I digitize them by scanning them on the scanner. That will then save them from ever fading, load them up to the cloud. And as long as the cloud exists for the next 50 years, they'll still be available for anyone who cares to view them. Now, prints, on the other hand, I don't care how good your printer is. I don't care how good your inks are. I don't care how good your paper is. Eventually, they will fade. They will all fade. How many generations down the road will it take? Who knows? Not really not really sure. Nobody has ever done. You cannot really trust um, accelerated tests either because they're not really real-world testing. Kenneth Poniatowski. Sounds Polish. Nice. Uh, my 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 wife's family is from uh, Milwaukee. A lot of Polish people. My uh, brother-in-law is Polish. I just ordered Lightroom and Photoshop 2022. Is this the best software to edit photos on Windows PC? Should I send edited photos to give image to print? Okay, so that's a good that's a good subject. Photoshop. It's a great photo editor, and a great just about anything else for graphics, for text overlays, for layering, for you name it, for um, um, after you scan a, a an old photograph and you want to restore it, that's what Photoshop is made for. And it can also print. It can do so many things. Lightroom is called Lightroom because it used to be a darkroom process. So Lightroom is designed by photographers for photographers. Photoshop is designed by photographers, graphic artists, and you name it for everything else. Lightroom, it is specifically for photo editing. Lightroom does not change your original raw file, for instance. It just keeps saving edits and it gives you virtual views of what you are editing, okay? Photoshop does not. Photoshop, yeah, while you are editing, is a virtual view of what you're looking at. But when you try to leave or you try to close that file, it's going to ask you whether you want to save it or not. You can save it as a secondary file at a whatever format you want to choose, JPEG, TIFF, um, you know, Photoshop file, PSD, or whatever. Lightroom does not do that. Lightroom opens up your raw file, creates a virtual view of it. You can make virtual copies of it if you want to do different edits for each virtual copy, different styles, whatever. And you close it, and it remembers every single edit step you made. It'll be part of a history. So to me, that's invaluable. So I don't really edit much in Photoshop. I did the Photoshop demonstration today because that's really the program most people will use. But again, I like to edit in Lightroom. And for printing, I use my QImage plugin to export to QImage. So what it will do from Photoshop, let me show you what that looks like. It saves all of these edits. Open up QImage and throw it over there. It saves your edits. Let me see if I can find my history. It's in here somewhere. All right. It's not. I cannot find it. But let me go ahead and do this a second here. Let's go ahead and also open up Lightroom, for instance. I'm glad you asked that. I hope I don't blow up my computer here with two hungry programs open. Let 
let's put Lightroom over here as well. So let's go ahead and jump in. So I have an image. It's not edited. So I will edit it. Blue, 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 blue. It's edited. And now I want to send it over to, well, what happened? And I want to send it over to Lightroom. So I will go to Files. I mean to a image File. And I got to make sure that I get this right. Plugin Extras. And I tell you what. Yeah, let's, let's use Ultimate. And that's it. So now it's going to open up Ultimate. And there is my image. You see it right there? And I can go ahead and print it. Simple as that. So why do why go through all that trouble? Okay, because it's better. It simply is better. Your output will be better quality. We'll back it up. Why not? Your output will be better quality than printing out of say Lightroom and, and, and Photoshop simply because of the output algorithm that it uses. In other words, how does it how does it adjust the DPI of the image? Because you could take an image with whatever dimensions, okay, whatever pixel dimensions and print it to whatever size and it's going to automatically up res it or down res. By that means down resolution or up resolution so that you end up at the correct DPI, PPI, for a particular printer make. Canon requires 300 PPI. Epson requires 360 PPI. Your, your PPI may be 279. So it's going to up-res it to 300 or 360 and do a perfect job, okay? which I would not trust just the driver to do, okay? And also the output sharpening will be adjusted correctly so that you get, depending on how big you're making or how small you're making that image, whether you have to down or up res it, it will calculate the amount of sharpening required. When you look at both outputs from either Photoshop or Lightroom and then QImage together and you pixel peep, you will choose Q image. And besides, that job will be remembered. The settings, the printer, the paper you use, the layout you pick, the size of the image, everything will be remembered. So you say, oh, gee, wow, remember that picture of the uh, woods that you had? I would love to have a print made out of it. But you know what? I don't want it to be um, 13 by 19. I want it to be 8 by 10. Okay. I open that job. It will still be at 13 by 19. All I got to do is just choose a smaller size. Otherwise, I print it to 13 and 19, the same exact way that I did it, say, six months ago. In, in the case of that, just over to the right of that scene is where this gigantic house is being built. They bought some land that belonged to the family and they killed all the trees that were back there. So it's just a big old house now. Instead of being beautiful woods, we used to be able to just hike, take hikes through and see deer walking by. So yeah, so say I shot that a year ago. Well, now that does not look the same. So it might be a good idea to provide a family member with, hey, remember what the woods used to look like? <laughs> yeah, I'll be able to go back, pull that, pull that job. I don't have to go back. Okay, here's the selling point. I don't have to go back and search where the heck is that folder with that image. I shot 500,000 images last year, during the year. I don't know what drive that was saved in, what the name of the folder was, what the date was. You have to search and search and search and search. It's like me on my phone, searching for photos. 
No. You go back to Woods, if that's what you named it. Nathan's Woods. That's my grandson. Find it. Okay, there's Nathan's Woods. Open it up. Job. Job. Mean the job designation means it will not only just set the settings with the printer, the paper, the size, the layout, the quality, the profile. Not only sets that up for you, it'll load the images that you use for that job. Maybe it was just one image. Maybe it was 10 images. Boom, like that. No searching, no wondering, whoa, gee, did I lose those? Nothing. What settings did I use? I have 17 printers. What did I use to print it on? I really love the way that came out. It will tell me, you use this printer, you use that paper, you use this profile. Come on. <laughs> Why would you not want that, right? So that's, to me, that's like one of the big selling points to having key image sitting on the sidelines most of the time because I won't use it for editing. You can edit. You can do some basic edits on it. Sometimes I will actually crop a little bit of something in, in Q image itself. It does have tools for that, but I do everything in Lightroom and then I just export out. Simple as that. Perfect. Sam C says, don't forget the thumbs up. Ah, yes. All right. Art, should have been you reminding everybody about that. Been busy away from screen and keyboard, but near enough to listen. Yes. You're the guy that's always cracking the whip with the smash, the like button. All right. Let's see what else we got. Jerry says, how many times can I recondition? Flush using glycerin formula. See like 42 cards before it starts to fail. Um, unless you physically damage them or the chip goes bad. Pretty much forever. Yeah. The reason you want to recondition is because after so many refills, especially if you don't catch it on time and you start getting air in that sponge. So remember, when you are using ink, you create a deficit in the sponge. Let's look at one of these here. So when you're drawing ink out, you create a deficit in the sponge. You start off, a resting cartridge will have a certain level of saturation. The bottom will be pretty much 100% saturated with the upper section not, not as high. You draw ink out of the bottom. That's the one that can deliver the maximum amount of ink. And you begin to create a deficit. Ink then enters from the liquid chamber through a little, a little orifice, a little hole on this wall. I don't know if you could imagine there's a vertical wall right here. So that hole in the bottom has a little hole in it. This is an optical sensor that will determine low warning for you. So ink goes out, creates a deficit. Ink goes in and replenishes that lower portion. If you're printing, 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 printing nonstop, you will have nonstop replenishing. Now this side goes empty and you did not catch it. Now there's nothing to replenish the ink. So you say you get one more print, squeezing one more print before you refill it. You have air in your sponge now. Air is very difficult to push out. Air is literally heavy. Imagine that. Liquid gets in and you start getting little pockets of air here and there. We call that foam. So after several cycles of this missing out, the magic moment to to top off your cartridge to reset it and refill it you have to re, you have to reflush it now you don't have to necessarily recondition it you can reflush it and dry it and fill it but the reconditioning sort of it permeates the internal fibers of this sponge with something that's very friendly to ink and that's a little remnant of glycerin it's only 2% so that glycerin, slight, tiny little bit of coating on each one of those little fibers is not going to evaporate. It's going to remain there. And ink will just go right in it. It just loves it. So you start off with a perfect condition cartridge again. And again, then you start the cycle yet again and then try to catch below low 
or at low. Below low means that you still have ink has already has still been set. Um, ink has still been uh, replenishing the sponge, so the sponge should be pretty much optimal at that point. Once you go past low, there's nothing but air getting in. Okay, there's no more ink to replenish it, and that's when you start building up your air or your foam. How many times can you do that? Forever, as long as you don't damage damage your, your cartridge. Nothing mechanically is happening internally anyway, other than hydraulics. Gerald Bam from Vancouver is here. Um, just bought a monochrome camera. A monochrome camera? Wonder how to print pictures from Canon Pro 1000. Which driver to use and make? I have i1 Pro. This was only one choice for driver, the Canon Pro 1000 driver. What do you mean by a monochrome camera? You mean a film camera? Okay. Then you will need a scanner as well that can handle film. Oh, QMH Ultra. So that's the ultimate. You mean ultimate. Yeah, so you need, you know, not much. You just need to, if you mean a film scanner, I mean a film camera, then you're going to scan your negatives with a scanner that can handle negatives, can handle transparent material, okay? Not just opaque material, like most scanners. My scanner can handle both, okay? It can illuminate from the top and from the bottom. And so it can do negatives. You can do negative to positive, and then you can process that in, Mo in Photoshop however you want it. And uh, when you scan... Even though it's a black and white negative, it's going to be a color image. So you still have to you have to turn it into a black and white, and that will remove. It might have a little bit of a color cast to it, so you might want to do that. And then you print it with your normal driver using uh, advanced. Um, in, in Canon, it's called black and white mode, and you should have very good results. I one Pro, again, you should be able to calibrate your monitor perfectly with it, and you're good to go. So if I print a test image without making any adjustments to it and your printer colors are not correct, is the problem with the printer? Problem could be with your settings as well. My strawberries look browner than on the screen. Hmm. Again, I don't have my crystal ball, my friend. So I have no clue what printer you're using. You're just telling me that you're using PC inks and PC profile for the paper. You know, I'm printing on. I could do that on the XP15000 with PC inks as well. And I get a neutral result. I get a perfect strawberry. <laughs> so I don't know. You have to tell me what you're doing. Oh, is that a, is that a Leica? L I. I've never heard of, yeah, Leica. That's an L. Yeah. Okay. So say, um, is that a, the M10? That's 35 millimeter. Because I used, oh my gosh, M3, way back, and an M2 too. So yeah, you should. You need to start. You need to get a print a, a scanner that can handle film, and uh, if you want to buy a dedicated scanner, they have. Dedicated scanners for 35 millimeter uh, film as well. If you're getting a, a, a cast, um, and say this is a Pro 100, PC Pro 100 inks is better than OEM. Okay. It's, it's better. Oh, no, it's digital. Okay. If, we're, if it's digital, then why are you saying it's monochrome? You mean it cannot shoot color? You cannot shoot RGB. That's kind of odd. Let me do something, you all. You all. I'm going to do, I don't know how this is going to work. Where's my paper? Right here. I normally don't do that, and it's going to be. 
time to go, but I'm going to try to do this for you all. I'm going to sacrifice one of my big sheets of paper here, 11 by 17. I'm going to load. The standard image. Okay, so it's a digital black and white. That's I have never heard of that. That's that's awesome. Pro 100 printing through Lightroom, no adjustments anywhere. Oh, ha ha ha! It's probably Lightroom. Lightroom has a weird. Um, yeah, what you describe is perfect. Yeah, Lightroom, for some reason. And I don't know whether it is uh, you on Windows. Um, I've had it. That's why I don't print in Lightroom anymore at all. Okay, let's go ahead and do this real quick. Let me let me load up Q image. I'm gonna put this in my printer. Take this out. I'm going to walk you through. This is what PC inks. Oh, on a Mac. Oh, boy. Sorry. Um, that could be, that could also be a reason because of Mac, uh, um, so called um, color management is different. Let me show you how you do it. Let me go ahead and I'm going to set this up on my regular monitor first. To make sure that I got everything correctly loaded. By the way, here. So this is this is what you get when you export something. See that? Everything is saved. I did all of these. These are scans. I did all of these exports. They're saved. I don't even know where the pictures, images are right now, but they are saved. See that? So everything is available. I can pull it out as a job anytime I want. Okay. Let me go back, grab this. Okay, I need to locate my standard images. Now I remember that's saved on the export folder. Stand test images. And uh, let's see, did it, did it, did it, did it. printer valuation. We'll use the XP 15,000. And I'll go through the settings again for you all. Okay, the size is going to be off because, of course, the standard image is smaller than a 17 by 11. All right, so we have premium paper photo luster, which is the paper I use to create the profile with. The rear paper feed, so that's the top feeder, not the, not the uh, tray in the correct paper profile that I made for it. We can go ahead and print it. We'll wait for it to queue up. It's going to make a little ding dong sound. And we'll wait. Meanwhile, we'll just keep on chatting. All right. So yeah, Mac uses a different type of um, methodology to uh, color management. So um, make sure you're not using print preview, by the way, that could cause a color shift. 
don't ask me why. It happens on Windows as well. Uh, Lightroom can on its own. It's printing correctly, and all of a sudden it just starts printing brownish. It's happened to me. So I only print on QImage now at all. We'll just let that sit. It's going to print. It's going to be fine. All right. So I'm curious about the uh, the Leica monochrome uh, camera. Like, why? Why does it do that? Why is it that a specific type of camera when you can easily turn or convert a RGB image into monochrome? Because if it's a single channel, you only have 255 shades of gray. That's not enough. I need 16 million plus shades of gray. So I wonder if it uses an RGB sensor, but only outputs to black and white. Then you could have, again, 1600, 16 million and a half shades of grays. That would be the only way. Imagine if I scanned my negatives, my black and white negatives, and use only, um, um, what do they call it, um, um, grayscale. That would only give me 256, 255 shades. I would definitely end up with a lot of posterization on skies and such. Yeah, it's a like a thing you say. Yeah, I know. You get finer edges, better dynamic range. Well, hey, you have it, so you you must know. Do you think it would be better using Canon Print Studio Pro from Lightroom? Try it. Canon Print Studio basically um, does everything for you. It's for the, not trying to insult you, but it's for the inexperienced printer. It's going to do a lot of color management for you, automatically for you. Now, are you printing on Canon papers? If you are, then if you let um, Print Studio Pro handle everything, it will do the color management for you. But that only works with a, you know, a branded paper. In other words, Canon on Canon. And if you had the equivalent type of software for Epson, that would be Epson on Epson. All right, let's look at our result here. Look at that. Now, again, my lights are not perfectly color balanced. So you might see a little cast, but this is absolutely neutral. This is gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Look how well these colors were represented here. And if I look at this under a backlight, I can see even the darkest two yeah, I can see two and four and six represented. That's what I mean. By reflective light, you can't see those. Light cannot pass through and bounce back and give you that result that backlit would do. Okay. So all I did was I told the printer to use a profile. Q image automatically sets color management for you. So Q image one might be a good choice for you to jump onto. Lightroom editing export to Q image one. Q image one works on Mac. Automatic everything, perfect, perfect. I'm telling you. So you might wanna you want you might wanna look into that. Again, the I have the links for the discounts. You don't want to pass this up. If you if you really want to try something that works, and again, that's what I just used now, QMH1. No, QMH Ultimate, sorry. But QMH1 is the one that will work on both platforms, either, either on Epson, I mean, sh either on Windows or Mac. Of course, Epson and Canon printers are all covered in automatic color management for people on Windows that have to do things manually. Automatic color management. It will turn off the driver if it needs to, or turn it turn it on. In other words, if the driver is going to control color, then it turns on that functionality in the driver automatically for you. If you choose to 
let Q image handle color management using a, a profile just like I did. It will then turn off color management in the driver. Simple. What else do you want? You know, and it's just something you don't have to think about anymore. Less of a headache. All righty. Hope you guys enjoyed today. I didn't have too many mistakes. Usually when I try to do demos, it's just, it goes crazy. <laughs> Let me see. Frank Collins says, just passing. Canon Pixma 200, Rick Johnson cards, chips, and PC inks going great. Happy holidays. All righty. And don't forget, for those of you who, you know, maybe um, arrive late, um, this will be available as a real video on YouTube later on. I got to give it a couple of hours, and I'll come over and I'll, I'll put some ad breaks on there because we got to earn some money to keep going here. So the ads are, are imperative that uh, we need to apply. I apologize for that. There's no way around that. If we don't do that, we earn nothing, and then the you know, the channel just goes goes away because this takes money. All right. Let me see what else we got here. From all half a dozen or so Canadians on today, thanks for sharing your experiences on your Sunday light chaps. Brightens up otherwise dreary cold days. It's going to get colder. We heard that this winter is going to be a lot worse than we have been had. Lately, we have we've been blessed with some pretty uh, decent, um, mild, if you will, winters the last couple of years. But it looks like this is not going to be the case. Gerald Bam says, thanks, Jose. Have a great week. And Grandpa Tom, I'm Grandpa Joe. I usually watch them on as a video. That's the way it's what I do. Unless you want to interact, you know, then you have to kind of hang out when it's live. <clears throat> there goes my voice. That's my cue to say goodbye, you folks. And I hope you guys enjoyed this as always. We'll be back next week. I hope to be able to have some free time. By the way, we're going away for the weekend, but we should be back by Saturday evening. We got to visit my wife's aunt in Fredericksburg, Virginia, which is a very nice historical area of Virginia. If you're into the Civil War, that type of stuff they have a lot of battlefields there you can visit anyway so we'll see you next time as always happy printing everybody and bye bye yeah let's get down please say goodbye on the chat and i will post it for you yeehaw